We are live to tape, so good day again, everyone. We're going to look uh, today and for the duration of this course at some things that philosophers find interesting. Uh, I hope some of you will also be interested in puzzles and paradoxes. Uh, they, they are sort of mind games, if you like. Um, they are going to boggle your minds a little bit uh, and hopefully uh, twist your minds into a new shape. Uh, but uh, philosophers find these to be, uh, I think, very uh, challenging and interesting things to do. And we have been posing and attempting to resolve paradoxes uh, for as long as there has been philosophy. So more than 2,000 years in the West, certainly 2,500 years or so. Uh, and, and there are also paradoxes and puzzles in Asia, Asian philosophy too. But we're, of course, going to focus consistently on the Western tradition. So before we even get started, uh, let me ask you if you know what a paradox is. You probably know the word. I'm going to put it in the chat room. It's not the same as a dilemma. So uh, a dilemma, as you may know, is a situation where uh, you have two choices and neither of them is really very good or ideal. So you're kind of, as we say in English, on the horns of a dilemma uh, because you're going to have to impale yourself, as it were, on one or the other choice, and neither is, is, is clearly better. So that's why we call it a dilemma. Uh, a paradox is different. Uh, we'll be looking at a very important dilemma as well in the third week of this section uh, called the prisoner's dilemma, but we're going to start with some paradoxes first. And, uh, okay, Ramses, it's like a contradiction. Very good. It is somewhat like a contradiction. Um, and indeed, it, it is actually a very reasonable-sounding argument that leads to a seemingly implausible or contradictory or downright crazy conclusion. So our challenge in a paradox is always going to be to find out where we went wrong in our assumptions, because obviously if we're running a totally rational argument and reach an absurd conclusion, there must have been something wrong with our reasoning. But the whole art of solving paradoxes is, is actually to identify what precisely did go wrong and where it went wrong and, and, and correct it, okay? And that will take care of the paradox. But there's also a transaction cost of doing this. So let me just share a slide with you if I can, uh, which will illustrate uh, what I've just said about paradoxes, but we will also show you that there, there's always going to be some kind of shift in our cognitive system when we resolve a paradox, the price of doing it will be always to modify some belief that we held about the world that turns out to be false. And that's why the paradox arose in the first place. Yeah. So when we resolve a paradox, it's a good thing, but it will almost always entail some modification uh, to what we believe about the nature of things, be it a logical or an empirical or some other kind of paradox. A paradox spans logical, conceptual, computing, uh, and, and scientific spaces as well. So just let me, uh, again, share this with you if I can, and, um, and we'll take a look at just a little preparatory slide. Uh, so a paradox, uh, this is in your Google Drive folders, a, a paradox is an argument. Uh, are you able to see this? It took a while to load up. Uh, can everybody? No, yeah. yeah. You're seeing it now, right? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so a, that's right. A paradox is an argument or deduction that leads from apparently rational or logical premises to a seemingly impossible, in other words, paradoxical conclusion. As one of you said earlier, it's, it leads us to a contradiction of some kind. A paradox arises because of a flaw in at least one of our premises and or an error in, in at least one of the background assumptions supporting our premises. Once the flaw or error is correctly identified, the paradox can be resolved. That, however, is easier said than done. We have disputes over paradoxes going on now for quite a long time because not all philosophers are necessarily agreed about which flaw or error is being correctly identified, as we'll see. However, here's the interesting thing. The, the corollary is the price we pay for resolving a paradox usually necessitate some change in our common sense or taken for granted understandings of things. And as mentioned, paradoxes arise in many domains from logical to empirical. Here are a couple of quick examples before we move on to Zeno, who is our main paradox poser this morning. Uh, but let me just continue. Here's an example of a computational paradox. Uh, we have two sentences 
Sentence 1 says that the following sentence is true, and sentence 2 says that the preceding sentence is false. So two statements referring to each other, and then the question is, is sentence 1 true or false? And if you program your computer to solve this problem, it's going to end up in a very tight infinite loop. <laughs> it will never stop computing, and it will never arrive at an answer. And we can mimic a computer uh, very easily and run through it ourselves. Okay, suppose that sentence one is true. I mean, it's either true or false, or so we like to think. Yes, all the way back, back to Aristotle, we suppose that declarative sentences are either true or false, and that there's nothing in the middle that, that's logically permissible as a, as a truth value. Okay, suppose sentence one is true. So does that make sentence two true or false? Can someone speak? Because I'm sharing the screen. I want to, to hear you. If sentence one is true, then what, what does that make sentence two? True or false? It makes sentence two um, true. Yes, because, because it's speaking about sentence two, right? So if it, sentence one is true, correct. Sentence two must be true. But if sentence two is true, then what does that make sentence one? Um, according to sentence two, it would mean that that's false. Yes. So you see, we're already caught in the paradox because we've assumed that sentence one is true. But if sentence one is true, it turns out to be false. And of course, the problem doesn't end there because if sentence one is false, then what is it saying about sentence two? Is sentence two, if sentence one is false, is sentence two true or false? Some of you might need some coffee this morning go to get your neurons firing for this, okay? So if sentence two is, is uh, true, then sentence one is false. And if sentence one is false, right, then sentence two false. Is, is, is false, false, exactly. But if sentence two is false, then sentence one must be If it's false... Oh, yeah that the preceding sentence is false, then it, the preceding sentence must false. be what? I mean, sentence one is false. No. If it's false, that's the, if, if two is false, it's saying the preceding sentence is false. If that's false, then the preceding sentence is what? It's true. True. So we're back where we started from. Yes, we've gone in a, in a very tight loop. And since it's impossible for a sentence to be both true and false, at least on a traditional Aristotelian reading, where declarative statements are true or false or unknown, but here we have a clear loop, which is one from which we never escape. Yes, your computer would very happily go through this loop until it burns out um, or until, you know, the grid collapses and it would never arrive at an answer. Yes, so we can't answer the question. Is sentence one true or false? Because as we alternate through the loop, we're going to get alternating values. So that's computational paradox. A logical paradox, this one goes all the way back to the Greeks who knew about it. There are many, many versions. It's called the liar paradox. Uh, but if I say I'm lying to you, is that utterance true or false? I guess you can't tell, really. Right. And why can't you tell? Because you just said that you're lying but you're making this declaration. <laughs> That's right. So if it's true, right? If, if, the, if it's true that I'm lying to you, then obviously I'm telling you a falsehood, right? Yes? So you see the similarity in the computational and logical version? The liar paradox has many, many variations, but also there's no escape from the, from the trap. Uh, you can't identify with any precision uh, whether, whether in fact the utterance is true or false, because you're going to end up with a contradictory result following the logic of, of any assumption you make about its truth or falsity, okay? So that's an ancient paradox. And here's, here's one of my favorites. This, this, this comes from a little uh, closer to our time, but a century or so, uh, turn, of the, turn of the last century. It's a set theoretic paradox. Um, we imagine now that there's a village and a barber, okay? There's one barber in the village, and we suppose that this barber shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself. 
I mean, that's perfectly reasonable. So if you shave yourself, then you don't need the barber to shave you. But if you don't shave yourself, then in fact, the barber will shave you. OK, so there's no contradiction there. Everybody in the village is either shaving themselves or being shaved by the barber. But now comes the problem. What does the barber do? <laughs> does the barber shave himself? Does anybody see the problem with that question? Yeah, who's the barber for the barber? Well, I mean, I'm not quite sure I understood you, but I, I, so if the barber, does the barber shave himself? Well, if the barber shaves himself, then he doesn't because the barber shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself, right? So if the barber shaves himself, then he doesn't shave himself. But suppose the barber doesn't shave himself. Well, if the barber doesn't shave himself, then he does. Because once again, the barber shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself. So you see, we're fine as long as we exclude the barber from the condition of this set of people in the village who are either shaving themselves or being shaved by the barber. And as, and as soon as we include the barber in that set of candidates to be shaved, then we, we encounter this, this paradox. And this, is, this points to a very, very deep question actually in, in set theory and in the composition of sets, and that's beyond our scope today. But I hope, do you see at least that this is a problematic, that these, these kinds of questions don't really have answers, they defeat our, our binary logic, yes? We're not able to answer these questions correctly, uh, arguably because there is no correct answer. Uh, these paradoxes are not resolvable unless unless we modify somehow the background conditions and place some very particular restrictions uh, and then we can attempt to kind of wrestle a solution out of this okay so yeah self-referential arsh well you are indeed uh, on, on on top of it um well ron he can't shave himself because he he shaves everybody who doesn't shave himself so if he shaves himself, it means he doesn't. And if he doesn't shave himself, it means he does. So, I mean, don't worry about this. this I mean, philosophers don't all lay awake at night worrying about this. But it's an example of some of the... We can foist perfectly reasonable conditions on a, on a given situation. But if we're not careful uh, about what we include in, in, you know, in certain sets or what we exclude from certain sets, we'll run into these kinds of problems. And Arsh, I, I'm very impressed with you this morning, although it's still early. Uh, you've identified the problem, in fact, of all three examples I've given you as a problem of self-reference. And that's exactly what it boils down to in, in slightly different contexts, be they logical, computational, um, or, or, or set theoretic, that when we have statements that refer to themselves, yes, that's right, uh, Arsh, that's the history of the barber problem, and uh, this emerges from some very, very deep uh, problems that were lurking in logic and set theory at the turn of the 20th century that nobody really knew about till they started looking into it. And then Goodell did the, the formative work. But that's an advanced topic. I just wanted to give you some examples. I mean, for today, just some quick and dirty examples of, of simple paradoxes and, and perhaps uh, why they're paradoxes. But Zeno or Zeno's paradoxes are different because they're they're empirical paradoxes, or they're meant to be thought of as empirical paradoxes, so they, they belong in a different class. Now, I don't want to confuse you. I'll enter the name Zeno in the chat room, Z-E-N-O, okay, or to our uh, non-American friends, if you're speaking UK English, it's Z-E-N-O, so I don't mind if you pronounce him Zeno, as we would in the U.S., or Zeno as we would in Canada or the UK, just like zebra and zebra, it's, it refers to the same animal. Um, so Zeno or Zeno, I may alternate depending on my mood, but uh, know that I'm speaking about this one guy, Zeno, who, who uh, Zeno of Elia, not Zeno of Citium. Apparently, Zeno was a common name in ancient Greece, uh, not so much today, but uh, this is Zeno of Elia, and uh, that's the city he came from. So... Uh, not to be confused with Zeno of Citium, who is the founder of Stoicism, very important school of philosophy, and even more today. But Zeno of Elia is the one who gave us these paradoxes, and there are four, uh, and they've all been solved, but some of them took 2,000 years, because Zeno had geometry, and he was a very good geometer, but it turns out that to solve some of these paradoxes, we actually need 
uh, some a little bit more of uh, modern mathematics, such as analysis, um, a little bit of elementary analysis or a little bit of elementary physics in the case of the arrow, as we'll see on Thursday. But we're going to cover two or today and on Thursday another. So we'll cover altogether three of his four paradoxes. And uh, they're all resolvable. But again, I, I ask you to bear in mind that resolving these paradoxes is nonetheless going to cause us to change something in our sort of common sense view of the world and, and our common sense of understanding of how things are, the nature of things. If we want to resolve uh, Zeno's problems, we'll, we'll have to make some modifications. And you'll see that very quickly as we get to the first one. Okay, so is everybody all right so far? This is just the setup. And uh, what we're going to do next is dive into the first, actually the first of his four paradoxes. Again, I'm covering three of the four, two today and one on Thursday. And I hope you'll cover that one in your breakout groups as well. Okay, so if we're good to go, let's, let's begin. The first one, and I have some slides. I'll, I'll show you the slide to start with. The first paradox is simply um, that uh, nobody can leave the room that they're in. And, uh, and the reasoning is as follows. Uh, if you want to leave the room, uh, whatever room you're in, whatever size room it is, Zeno argues that you can't do it. And the reason you can't do it is simply the following. Before you can get to the door, I mean, wherever you are in the room, if you want to leave the room, you have to get to the door. OK, so before you get to the door, says Zeno, you have to get halfway to the door. I mean, that's perfectly plausible and commonsensical, right? You have to get halfway before you can go the whole way. But then he goes on to extend that argument and says, but wait a second, before you can get halfway to the door, you have to get a quarter of the way to the door. And before you get a quarter of the way, you have to get an eighth of the way. And before you get an eighth of the way, you have to get a sixteenth of the way. And if we keep having those increments, we'll go on infinitely and you'll never get anywhere because they're infinite. You know, the series one over n squared is an infinite series and it has, therefore, infinite terms. And you could never, says Zeno, you, know, you, you, you could never cover all of those uh, increments or those intervals. And so you can't leave the room. Now, here's the problem. We all know we can leave the room. But then how do we do it? How do we cover an infinite number of steps in a, in a finite way? How are we able to do this? So you see, we know empirically we can leave the room, but we still have to give Zeno an explanation of how it's possible given that we really do have to get halfway, quarter of the way, eighth of the way, and so forth. All right. So uh, you heard this before, Brandon. Good for you. Where did you come across this or some variation of it? YouTube. Okay. Well, I'm glad people are looking at, uh, at constructive and interesting things on YouTube as well as all the other stuff that's out there. Okay. Let's have a look at a slide. Let me share again a slide with you. This is sometimes called the dichotomy paradox. And uh, I'll show you the slide momentarily. And here it is. All right. Is everybody, is everybody seeing this time? I think it's a little yes. quicker. It loaded up. Okay. So premise one, if you want to leave the room or a room, you have to get halfway to the door, obviously. Uh, well, but if you want to get halfway, you also need to get a quarter of the way first. And if you want to get a quarter of the way first, you need to get an eighth of the way first, etc. That's spelled out. We usually say ETC period, but that's the whole word. So conclusion is you can never complete all these steps. And so you can never leave the room. Now, we know that's nonsense. But the problem is not that we can't leave the room. The problem is what's wrong with Zeno's reasoning. This is, you know, the resolution of the paradox entails that we identify the, what, what part of the argument is mistaken. And this turns out to be not trivial. I mean, in retrospect, it's easy, right? If you know how to do something, it's always easy. But if, if you're trying to identify what goes wrong in Zeno's logic, it's really not that clear because the premises seem fair enough. So what's, what's the problem? Well, if you can set it up, there are a number of approaches you could take. Is the speed the same for all steps or different? It doesn't matter in this case, Arsh, because we're not factoring in speed. We're factoring in distance, and we keep having the distance at any speed. You're still going to have the distance, okay? So time is not the issue either. These are not paradoxes of motion, although they're set out that way. This paradox is a paradox of the infinite division of space, okay? The infinite division of spatial distance. 
And all of Zeno's paradoxes have a common denominator, by the way. Uh, he's attempting to prove that motion is impossible. And again, that's outrageous on its face, yes? I mean, we all know that everything's moving, ourselves included. But Zeno's arguments are showing us that motion, as we ordinarily conceive it, is somehow not possible, and we have to change something in our conception in order to make it work, even though we're all moving around. It's not quite clear how we do so. If we are to set up arbitrarily, so, so, so Arsh, don't complicate this unnecessarily. I promise it will get very complicated on Thursday when we look at the arrow paradox. Okay, don't get ahead of us. The arrow paradox is one in which Zeno says that an arrow unleashed from a bow cannot possibly fly through the air. Don't try this at home. Okay, don't try this at home. You know that an arrow shot from a bow tends to fly through the air. But again, Zeno makes a very interesting argument to the effect that it can't. We'll do that Thursday in my breakout group. But for today, we're, we're looking at these uh, more or less spatial uh, paradoxes. They don't involve velocity and they don't involve time. They involve dividing space only. So you can take any time to, well, if you take any time to cover these steps, again, or you're making this complicated, um, which is interesting because, because if you want to convert this to time, you're still going to need an infinite amount of time to complete an infinite number of steps, are you not? If you want to, if you want to transpose this problem from a spatial problem to a temporal problem, you can do so, but you don't escape the difficulty because if it takes you half a second to take the first step and a quarter of a second to take the second step and an eighth of a second to take the third step and so forth, and one over two to the n uh, <coughs> seconds to take the, the, the nth step, uh, well, you're still going to end up with an infinite amount of time, are you not? Or an infinite uh, number of intervals of time. Well, it turns out in this case that uh, whether you do it spatially or temporally, it's not a problem in one sense, because what we can do very easily is discover that this series, a half plus a quarter plus uh, 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 everything else uh, in the series, uh, does have a finite sum. Um, so this is um, this is something entirely entirely uh, different. Please don't send me direct messages now. I cannot interrupt the lecture to reply to them. Uh, stay in class if you can, and I'll I'll answer you uh, immediately after class. Okay? Please don't interrupt my train of thought by messaging me in private. It's it's just not workable. Okay? Be considerate of everybody and let me deal with this topic, and then I'll speak to you gladly after class for a minute. All right, so if we just add up every term in this infinite series, it does go on forever. It turns out very, very strangely and, and fortuitously in this case to have a finite sum, okay? Um, but that, that still doesn't solve the problem because we're still asking this question, how is it possible, even if the series has a finite sum, how is it possible for us to do an infinite number of things in a finite time or in a finite space? And so we, we, we can understand this in a kind of uh, mathematical sense, but it still doesn't explain to us how it's possible to answer Zeno. Just because a series has a finite sum, it still, in fact, contains infinite number of terms. So we still have this question that's hanging in the air. How do we take an infinite number of steps in a finite time? Is this clear to you? Yeah? Well, it's a, it's a finite distance, so we know we can traverse it, Ron. But the problem that Zeno is posing indirectly is how do we manage to do an infinite number of things in a finite time? Or how do we manage to take a finite space and divide it infinitely? This is not a trivial question at all. Let me show you uh, how we can resolve this by making, again, this all-important modification to what some of us may be assuming. And in fact, what some of you may have assumed all your lives without ever challenging it, we now need to challenge this in order to settle Zeno's hash in this case. So here's the deal, my friends. If you consider the following diagram, this is actually going to explain how we do this uh, and also, on the other hand, at the same time, shock us because it's going to reveal something that probably we hadn't considered. Uh, maybe some of you have, but most of you probably have not. If we look at two lines, L1 and L2, all right, these, these lines are obviously of, of different lengths. If you measure L1 and you measure L2, 
uh, you will certainly discover that L2 is longer right, than L1. I mean, that's by inspection. Uh, you know that it is, and it's not difficult to prove that it is. Um, you can do it empirically by measurement, or you can do it in other ways. But it's clear that L2 is longer than L1. That's not a surprise. That's common sense. But the shocking thing is, and Zeno didn't know this, but now we know, that they both contain the same number of points. This is the really shocking thing. They both contain an infinite number of points. And in fact, you can prove this by putting those points in one-to-one -one correspondence. Because if you take those two lines, L1 and L2, and you construct a triangle with uh, apex or vertex V, and you start drawing straight lines, those are in red, yeah? If you draw straight lines through, uh, from V, through both L1 and L2, what you discover is that each straight line that you draw actually uniquely picks out two points, right? It picks out a point on L1 and picks out a point on L2. Call them x1, y1. You draw another straight line, it picks out x2, y2. You draw another straight line, it picks out uh, x3, y3. And you see that there are an infinite number of pairs of points that are being picked out, and none of them are repeating. They're all unique pairs of points. And so what we're doing in contemporary language is that we are actually showing that the number of points on L2 is exactly the same as the number of points on L1, even though the length of L2 is much greater, it might be double or whatever it is, it's much bigger than L1, and yet they both contain the same number of points. Now, doesn't that surprise you a little bit? Isn't that a little bit shocking? Or not? Not really, okay, Ramses. That doesn't surprise you. I would be surprised if it. I would. I would be surprised if if no one were surprised by this, uh, because no, we generally, I think, intuitively but mistakenly assume uh, that. And correct me if I'm mistaken. And Ron seems to be in that camp. And I was in that camp for a long time. Well, you would tend to think that the longer a line is, the more points it contains. That's common sense. You know what I mean. Uh, the bigger a bag, the more apples you can put in it. You know, the longer the longer something is, the more you can subdivide it. But actually, it turns out that this is a very clear demonstration that 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 in fact, irregardless of the length of a line, uh, every line contains what an infinite number of points. Yes, infinite number of points. So this is now the solution to Zeno's problem, because it turns out that we can take a step. And every time we take a step, we are crossing a finite interval. If you take a big step, a big interval, a small step, a small interval, right? A baby step, a baby interval. It doesn't matter uh, what size step you take. You're crossing a finite measurable interval of space. But that interval will still contain an infinite number of points, no matter how big or small it is. So Zeno was pointing out correctly that every interval of distance, of spatial distance, contains an infinite number of points, but that doesn't mean we have to count them all up in order to step across it. Is that clear to you? Good. Okay. I mean, that's in one sentence the, what we would say to Zeno if he came back today. We'd say, look, Zeno, you know, we don't have to count to infinity every time we take a step. Uh, because fortuitously, we can just step over any uh, given interval of space, and we're not bothered by the fact that it contains an infinite number of points. I mean, we're not bothered when we're trying to leave the room, but it's still rather perplexing and counterintuitive that the number of points on a line turns out to be, in fact, independent of its length, right? That's the assumption that has to be clarified and as long as we were thinking that a longer line contains more points and a shorter line contains fewer points, then definitely we'd be defeated. Um, well, the line is infinitely divisible, or every line is infinitely divisible. Uh, but but in reality, well, what's reality, Arsh? <laughs> I mean, no, in reality, in reality, well, physical systems. I mean, is that reality? Is it only the physical that's real? Don't you remember Descartes? Is mathematics real? The reality we perceive. All right, well, if you're going to be a complete empiricist about this, uh, then uh, that's fine. But even even the most hard-boiled empiricists like Hume and Berkeley, uh, one a materialist, the other an immaterialist, will still concede that there are mental operations that we perform 
and, and there are things we can do with logic and mathematics that are absolutely non-physical. Yeah? And that would include drawing diagrams like this or simply imagining them. I mean, can you perceive in your mind that two different lines both contain an infinite number of points even though they have different lengths? You don't need to draw this. You can just conceive it. Can you not? Hopefully you can. And uh, please don't now start arguing that perception is reality or that reality is perception. I think at this point in the course, we, we know better than that, uh, that, that uh, what we perceive is certainly not the whole by any means of what is out there. We only perceive a very, very thin slice of reality at the best of times. So I, I don't want to get into that debate. That's more of an epistemological debate. What I'm trying to get you to, to realize is that just it's a simple fact that most of us probably uh, would, 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 in a commonsensical way, go wrong by supposing that the longer a line is, the more points it contains, okay? If you want to look more deeply, some of you have expressed some interest in this already, and I'm glad to see it. This is making you think in a, in a different way about some of these problems. Uh, they have conceptual dimensions and they have practical dimensions. All of Zeno's paradoxes have both. But if you want to look into how um, this, it's not the Banash-Tarsky paradox either. Again, you're, 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 the Banash-Tarsky paradox is a distant relative of this kind of problem, but it's much more, much more complicated, okay? Much more complicated. So here is the thing. Uh, you can double the line, you can triple the line, you can quadruple the line, you can do whatever you want to do with the line. Uh, Arsh, but, but you're still going to find out that every segment of that line, no matter how long or short it is, contains an infinite number of points, and we do not empirically have to count the points. We don't worry ourselves that every time we take a step, we're stepping over an infinite number of points. That doesn't deter us, right? Zeno was focusing on the points. Okay, um, so, well... Well, the thing is that here's the thing, Ron. We did geometry way back in the day, you remember, and uh, uh, and and a uh, point doesn't have size. That's right. This is the problem, that a point has position but no magnitude. And that's precisely why every line segment can contain an infinite number of points because they, they don't take up space. This is another very problematic thing if you really try and understand it. A point has a, has a position but it doesn't take up any space whatsoever in any direction is a conceptual thing uh, but every line segment has an infinite number of them and we can take a step without worrying about that Zeno wanted us to worry about that and that's partly why he's able to produce this paradox all right but the resolution of it I'm, I'm simply repeating there are different ways you can attempt to resolve this um, if you want to read if you google Z Zeno's paradoxes uh, you're going to find all kinds of explanations for each of them. And if you're interested in this kind of problem, I encourage you to look more deeply into them. There are different ways to approach them. I'm giving you what I consider to be the simplest in this case, right? But it's not by any means a unique way of explaining the paradox. But nonetheless, we, we do have to make this modification to our background assumptions and admit that the length of a line has nothing to do with the number of points it contains. Yes, that, that's the key assumption. That allows us to agree with what Zeno was saying, but to dispute his conclusion that somehow the fact that every segment contains an infinite number of points means we can't move anywhere. Well, no, we can just step over them. Um, I mean, that, that, that's the, the, the most simple way of refuting the problem, but also acknowledging that he's correct in a certain way. All of Zeno's paradoxes say something correct about the world. Uh, they are just uh, saying uh, something that plays on our common sense assumptions that sometimes are not exactly correct okay so um well in reality we what we perceive is discrete or well again i i challenge that uh we don't perceive anything discrete if we're looking at white light we know that incoherent white light contains all the colors of the spectrum but we're not perceiving them only when you refract them through a prism do you see them decomposed into their proper frequencies right so then you see the prism which are the discrete wavelength groups, and then you start seeing those colors associated with them. But if you're just looking at incoherent light, you don't see any, anything discrete. You see it as continuous. So again, you know, I don't want to make this about perception. If you make this about perception, then you're going to embark on a completely different set of problems. 
which are very interesting, both philosophically and scientifically, but really nothing to do with Zeno's paradoxes, which are essentially thought experiments. Yeah, they're thought experiments. So please treat them as thought experiments. And they're not about perception. They're about our way of thinking about things that could conceivably take place in the world, such as people leaving the room. Okay, is that fair enough? But I certainly am glad to see that this has got you all thinking about things this early in the morning. That's certainly a positive. Okay, are there any other comments or questions about this? Uh, I want to move on to the second one, which I think is far more challenging, actually, although it's also resolved, but it's something that's going to baffle some of you. You're going to have to think a little bit more carefully in order to see through the second problem. But before we go there, are there any other, other questions or, or comments about this problem? Okay, uh, again, it's because you know too much, Arsh. Your, your mind is absolutely chock full of physics, and, uh, and you're, you have so much going on in your mind that you're, you basically need to take a cloth and wipe it clean. Okay, and you're just make it a lot. You're you're making this way more complicated. Uh, it's got nothing to do with Planck length. I mean, that's the shortest measurable distance in the universe. It's got nothing to do with the number of points on a line, which is far greater than the Planck length, because a point has no length. Yes, a point has no length. All of the physics that Planck did starts with Euclid's geometry and starts with the definition of a point. I mean, all these physicists were great geometers. Uh, they had to invent new geometries in order to do their physics, quantum geometry um, you know, and relativistic geometry. But if you go back to the Euclidean world, which is what we mostly inhabit, then the classic definition of a point is that which has position but no magnitude. So it's, it's not the Planck length, it's a zero. A point has zero magnitude. If you measure a point in any direction, it has zero length, zero breadth, zero width, zero height, zero depth, zero any dimensionality, but it does have a position, okay? Is it only a mathematical paradox? Well, it's, yes. I mean, the short answer is that's right. It's a mathematical, this first one is a mathematical paradox, okay? Good, good. So please don't overcomplicate them um, unnecessarily. That will only create more confusion for you. So please, these are not difficult to state. The resolution, however, is in a mathematical domain, not in the domain of, of quantum physics whatsoever. All right. So let's go on to the second one, which I think is actually more difficult. They get progressively more interesting. Uh, let's, let's have a look at the second one and see what you make of it. I'll stop this share. Now, the second one is a bit of an allegory, and it... Uh, it has to do with Achilles and the tortoise, and it's a race between Achilles and the tortoise. Now, you all know uh, Achilles was, uh, was a very fast runner, yes? This is from uh, Greek mythology. We all know, among other things, that Achilles was exceedingly fleet of foot, right? That's how you spell Achilles. And we all know that a tortoise is a pretty slow animal, right? Tortoises at top speed are moving maybe one mile an hour, something like this, or a fraction of that. They're they're very long lived, but they're not quick. So so here is what happens, and and uh, Zeno is going to again posit this thought experiment of a race between Achilles and the tortoise. Now, in order to make it fair, because of course Achilles is a very swift runner, tortoise is very slow. Zeno says, let's give the tortoise a head start. Okay, we'll give the tortoise a head start. And then when the tortoise reaches a certain point, again, this is arbitrary. We're not putting a ruler on it. We're not saying, you know, this is exactly how far the tortoise goes before Achilles. We're just saying in general. So it's independent of a particular measure or a particular metric. We're just saying, let the tortoise have a head start arbitrarily, you know, some head start. And then when the tortoise reaches a certain point, we let Achilles start running. Okay. Now, Zeno is going to argue that if you give the tortoise a head start, that Achilles can, in fact, never catch the tortoise. Now, that sounds ridiculous, and we know, again, commonsensically, 
that uh, if the race is long enough that a swifter runner will overtake a slower runner, right? Even if the slower runner gets a head start, and we're assuming the race is long enough for that to happen. But what is the argument? Well, Zeno's argument is as follows. If you give the tortoise a head start, let's say to point A, a little further down the track, so the tortoise is at, reaches point A before Achilles is allowed to start running. Okay, what happens next? Achilles starts running, and Achilles covers that distance to point A much faster than the tortoise did. No, it doesn't, Ramses, depend on the actual distance. That Again, I'll repeat this. It's really essential that you free your mind from how far ahead is the tortoise. It makes no difference. As long as the tortoise gets a head start, Zeno's argument will go through, and it will tell you that Achilles can never touch the tortoise. So please let me explain. Okay, the tortoise, you have to be able to think in generality and not be weighted down with numbers, specific numbers. They don't matter. Okay, they don't matter in this problem. What matters is the conceptual aspect of what's going on. The tortoise gets an arbitrary head start to point A down the track. Okay, it doesn't matter what the distance is as we measure it. Just an arbitrary head start. And then Achilles is allowed to start running. So, what happens, says Zeno, is the following thing. At some stage, Achilles will reach point A, right? And will reach it much quicker than the tortoise did. But by the time Achilles reaches point A, the tortoise will have moved a little further down the track. Isn't that right? Yes, when Achilles reaches point A, the tortoise will be at point B, which is further ahead. You get this? Is everybody seeing this? Okay, it's very simple. Very simple argument. Sure. And then Achilles will make up that distance, which is a smaller distance, but Achilles will get to point B a lot quicker than the tortoise did. But wait a second, says Zeno. By the time Achilles gets to point B, the tortoise will also be further down the track at point C. And each of those increments will get smaller and smaller. But if you run that argument again ad infinitum, you'll discover that wherever uh, Achilles catches up to where the tortoise was, the tortoise is always going to be a little bit further ahead by an ever-diminishing increment of distance, but the tortoise will always be ahead. And therefore, Zeno says, Achilles can never catch the tortoise. That's his paradox. Again, common sense tells us and should be telling all of you that that's impossible because, of course, there's going to come a point where Achilles will catch the tortoise and pass the tortoise, Right? I'm not trying to trick you. I mean, that's our experience of the world, is it not? The faster runner always catches the slower run if, it, runner if the race is long enough, and we're assuming the race is long enough, so we know that's going to happen. So what's wrong? The, the, the real challenge is you know, to identify, once again, what's wrong with the argument. There's something deeply wrong with the argument, and it's something that I don't think Zeno understood himself. He was very clever to posit this problem, but he himself did not have the mathematics to understand exactly what the problem was. We today do. So I'm going to share this with you. But first, the diagram. Let's look at a picture. I'll just share a picture with you because a picture is worth a thousand words. And then you'll see quickly, hopefully, from the picture, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see exactly what I've just illustrated verbally to you. Uh, so just bear with me. Uh, here's a picture of the, of the paradox. Okay, so once again, uh, I hope th this should be helpful because what we can see now very clearly is that um, Achilles is here and the tortoise was allowed to start here at this first dotted line, yeah? That first arrow points to the head start point. So uh, when the tortoise started running from here, Achilles had to make up that distance to get there. Of course, he did it quicker than the tortoise, but by the time Achilles gets there, the tortoise is a little further ahead now. And then Achilles has to catch up to that point, which he will, and he'll do it quicker than the tortoise. But even so, by the time Achilles reaches this point, the tortoise is a little further ahead, and then he'll similarly catch up there, but then the tortoise is further ahead, and this goes on infinitely. And yes, uh, Ashanti, the distance will keep diminishing, but it will not be zero. How can it be zero? Because this diagram never lets you get to zero. That's the whole problem, that wherever you are on this diagram, the tortoise is always a little bit further ahead. You're just saying it will eventually be zero because you know in common sense terms 
that eventually Achilles will draw level with the tortoise, and so the distance will, as you say, be zero. But wait a second, you haven't explained the problem away by asserting that, of course, Achilles will touch the tortoise. How could he? On this, on this argument, he never will, because however far you protract this diagram, you will keep getting less and less and less distance, but we already know from the first paradox that we can subdivide a line infinitely, right? That distance can get smaller and smaller and smaller and never necessarily get to zero, yeah? Remember, we can keep making the distance as small as we like, and we can keep having that distance or quartering that distance or dividing that distance however we like, but there's still something there. We never get to zero by division, right? So therefore, exactly right, Brandon, this is the graph. This is, you know, our problem is to explain what's wrong with this graph. Because Achilles is obviously, in our common sense world, going to catch the tortoise at some point. But then, what's wrong with Zeno's argument? That's right. That's right, Yusef. Uh, the tortoise is always going to be ahead, except by an ever-diminishing his lead will keep shrinking. The tortoise's lead will get smaller and smaller. But every time Achilles reaches the point where the tortoise was, the tortoise is still going to be a little bit further ahead by an ever-diminishing amount of distance. So Zeno says Achilles can never catch the tortoise. And we know that to be untrue. We know that to be not paradoxical to argue this way. But remember, in a paradox, you can't just say, well, everybody knows that he will. That's not a refutation. You're appealing to common sense. And remember, appeals to common sense are, in critical thinking, a huge problem. Just like saying, well, everybody knows the earth is flat. Well, if you'd said that 400 years ago, everybody would agree with you. If you say it today, nobody will, except for the Flat Earth Society. So, I mean, you can't appeal to common sense to explain away logical arguments. You have to actually identify the flaw in the argument itself. Are we clear? We have to be able to say what's wrong with this argument. We, we can't just say, well, we know that Achilles will catch the tortoise. Yeah, but how? How? So, you see, that's why it's a paradox. So, it's, 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 it's the art of, res of resolving a paradox is to explain where Zeno went wrong in his reasoning, if indeed his problem is so out of place, out of step, contrary to common sense. We still have to show where it goes wrong. And that's not, that's not trivial, right? Not at all trivial, okay? Although there is a, an explanation. But it will require some subtlety of thought. And again, I, I guarantee that some of you at least, maybe many of you, will not have taken this under consideration. What Zeno is really showing us here is not what he intended to show us at all. He's actually pointing out something very, very interesting that has once again to do with infinities. But he, he's, he's not demonstrating that Achilles will never catch the tortoise. He's demonstrating something that's even worse in a certain way. So I'm going to say it in English, all right? I'm going to resolve this with you in, you know, a, a matter of seconds but or minutes. It's not going to take long to explain the problem. So Zeno is showing something that he didn't intend to show, but which is nonetheless actually very interesting and will ha make you rethink the whole situation. So I'll say it first, and then I'll type it in the chat room, and then I'll say it again and let it sink in, okay? A way, and again, these paradoxes can be resolved using different approaches, but this, I think the simplest approach is as follows. Zeno is not showing us, contrary to what Zeno claims to be showing us, Zeno is not showing us that Achilles can never catch the tortoise. What this diagram is actually illustrating is something much more subtle. Zeno is illustrating by his argument and by this diagram that there is no final instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. That's what he's really showing. That I'll say it again. There is no last instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. But just because there was no last instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise does not mean that there is no first instant at which Achilles succeeds in catching the tortoise. Now, that's a mouthful, both in, in English and conceptually, so I'm going to type it in, okay? I will type it in so that hopefully everybody can digest this. Zeno is actually, and this is not what he was trying to do. He was trying to show that Achilles could never catch the tortoise. But what he's actually showing us, Zeno is actually showing that 
there is no last instant at which there is no last instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. Now that's the first half of the explanation and you need to digest this. This is what goes on to infinity. This is where Zeno's right. He, he's, he's, he's demonstrating what I've just typed in and will enter for you. What this diagram really shows is that there's no last instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. There are, in fact, an infinite number of instants at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. It's just that in the process of the unfolding of that infinite number of instants at which he fails to catch the tortoise, he gets closer and closer to the tortoise, right? He gets closer and closer to the tortoise. But there is no last instant at which he fails to catch the tortoise. Now, does this, is this actually very deeply puzzling to any of you? It should be. Yeah, good, good. I mean, it's really amazing because he, he didn't himself understand this when he posed the problem. But let me illustrate it to you in a slightly different way. And then those of you who are still scratching your heads or tearing your hair out over this, maybe a light will come on if I say it a different way. Uh, let me ask you this question. Suppose I ask you, what is the number, if we're on a number line between 0 and 1, right? Let me ask you, what is the f number that's closest to 1? I mean, we're talking about real numbers. So it could be decimals, you know, fractions, decimals, any, any kind of number you like. So what's the number that's closest to 1? Is there a number that's closest to 1? Well, if you say that's right, you guys are right on the ball here, Yusef. If I say Yusef is correct, if you're seeing this, so, so if you say Yusef 0.9, I will say 0.99. That's right. And we can go on, Ramses. We can go on infinitely and add all those nines to the string, and we'll get closer and closer and closer to 1. But we will never arrive at a number which is the closest number to 1. Correct? So in other words, there is no number, which is the largest number that fails to be one. Now, it's not like limits, Ramses. Again, it's a little more simple than that. We're not asking about limits. We're just asking what is the largest number that, that, is, that is, you know, close to one but not one. Well, there is no such number because any number you name that's close to one, we can always find an, another number between that number and one. It's like dividing space infinitely. We can divide a number line infinitely. Yes? So there is no largest number that fails to be one, that is just falling short of one. There's always an infinite number of numbers in there. And similarly, there's no last instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. There's an infinite number of instants at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. But, but that doesn't show the fact that there is no largest number just short of one that doesn't show that we can't have a number one and similarly in this problem just because there is no last instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise does not imply or prove that there is no instant first instant at which he does because obviously there is a first instant at which he does catch the tortoise in spite of the fact that there are an infinite number of instants at which he fails to that's what's interesting and if you watch two runners going down the track if you watch, you know, the kick, let's say you're watching an 800 meter race and one runner is in the lead and then you have some other runner coming up really swiftly, you know, and sometimes in the Olympics you'll see this, the runner coming up saves his burst for the last right moment and then suddenly just passes that runner and crosses the line first. So this is like this problem. You would, you would have to say there is no last instant at which, you know, which the runner who was behind <laughs> fails to catch the runner who is in front, but there is a first instant at which he does, right, and then passes him. And similarly, there will be a first instant at which Achilles draws level with the tortoise. And that's where you guys who were fixated on numbers earlier in the problem, you can then plug in, I mean, if you know the speed of Achilles, assume it to be constant. If you know the speed of the tortoise, assume it to be constant. If you know the head start, if you know, you know, those things, 
then you can certainly calculate the point at which Achilles will catch the tortoise. Yes, that's trivial. You know, you don't even need physics 101 to do that. You could just apply the formulae distance equals rate times time, and, uh, you know, you can equate um, the, the distance and, and figure out the different times from the different rates, and you'll know when they're going to intersect. That's not difficult to do, but it still will not put a hole in the claim that there's no last instant at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise. There are, in fact, an infinite number of instants at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise. But again, to be clear, that does not prove that there is no first instant at which Achilles succeeds in catching the tortoise. Okay? Well, um, again, Ramses, um, he can approach the tortoise, and we'll get closer and closer to the tortoise, and we'll fail an infinite number of times. An infinite number of instances will, will arise in which he fails to catch the tortoise, but there will always be a first instant at which he will draw level with the tortoise. Yeah? There is always going to be a first instant, just like there is no largest number that's smaller than one, but there is a number that is one, right? Is this clear to some of you? I hope it's clear to some of you. Maybe not all of you yet. These problems are easy to state, but as you can see, not trivial, right? Relatively, okay, well, that's why, why the, our rule of thumb, don't lose sight of our rule of thumb, is an hour outside of class for every hour we spend in class. You want to be able to think this through in your own mind until you see very clearly what Zeno is claiming and where he's right and where he's wrong and where in cases like this he's actually demonstrating something he didn't intend to demonstrate but nonetheless did. But still doesn't prove that Achilles won't catch the tortoise because of course we know Achilles will if the race is long enough. Of course he will. But now I'm going to, at the risk of confusing some of you further who think now it's clear, I mean we could run this argument again and I'm going to do it right now um, and ask you now imagine, okay, that Achilles finally has drawn level with the tortoise, because we know in the real world that happens. The faster runner overtakes the slower runner. At some point, they're in the same place exactly, yeah? And that's not a trick. They really are. At some point, they are exactly level, yeah? But just as there is no last instant at which Achilles fails to overtake the tortoise, it will turn out by symmetric reasoning that there is no first instant at which Achilles succeeds in overtaking the tortoise either, which never occurred to Zeno, but which sounds to us absolutely crazy, but it's exactly the same reasoning. If there's no last instant at which he fails to overtake the tortoise, there can similarly be no first instant at which he, at which he succeeds in overtaking the tortoise, even though there is a first instant at which they draw level. There's one and only one instant at which they draw level. But after that, it's easy to run Zeno's argument again, and once again showing something he didn't intend to show, which, which I think illustrates how, how interesting the paradox really is. Because think about it. If I, if I ask you guys the same question about the numbers, you know, there's no number that's the largest number that's falling short of one. If I ask you the same question, what's the, what's the first number after number one? Now, what's the first number that's bigger than one? Anybody? What's the first number that's bigger than one? I mean, I'm not talking about integers. I mean, again, real numbers, right? Like decimals. What's the first number that's bigger than one? Anyone? No, 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 no. Well, that's right, Ramses. You, you, you can say, what, no, not two. No, 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 two, Andrew. There's an infinite number of numbers between one and two. Again, I'm asking you not, we're not dealing with integers, right? We're dealing with, yes, 1.01, 1.001, ad infinitum. Exactly, Yousef. Uh, you're on the ball this morning, meaning that we can't find the number that's, we can't find the first number that's bigger than one because whichever number you name, we can always find a num another number between that one and one, which is in between the two, by the expedient of adding another zero before the one. So, in fact, there are an infinite number of numbers after one, none of which is the first one, okay? There are an infinite number of numbers after one between any number you care to name and one itself. So, there is no first instant at which Achilles, the, the conclusion of this, if you reapply it to Zeno's problem, it's even more startling. Just as there was no last instant at which Achilles failed to overtake the tortoise, there was also no first instant at which Achilles succeeds in overtaking the tortoise. 
Well, that's what Zeno will say, Yusef. I mean, I hope you're, you're getting a laugh out of this because consistent with Zeno's reasoning, there's no, if there's no way he can draw a level, then there's no way he can pass him either by the same argument looking, you know, through the looking glass on the other side of the number law, you know, the other side of the point of intersection, wherever that may lie, there's also no first instant at which he passes the tortoise, just as there was no, no last instant before he catches him. There's no first instant, you know, at which he passes him. But this points once again to this very problematic notion of infinity, that we can keep subdividing a line, at least conceptually, as many times as we like. And we'll never reach a definitive point that's closest to any other point. Because between any two points on a line, there's always an infinity of other points. We already know this from the first paradox. Any line contains the same number of points as any other line, regardless of their length. So the fact is, though, that and what we get sidetracked into, into you know, forgetting is that there still is a definite place in which Zeno catches the tortoise, one and only spot, you know, one and one, one and only one spot where they actually intersect. And if you know their actual speeds, or you can represent them algebraically, and you, 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 can, you can illustrate that with a formula. Where is it that Zeno will overtake the tortoise? You could say, and you'd be right. But by the same token, you could never say what's the last instant at which he fails, nor can you say, uh, you know, to catch the tortoise, nor can you say, nor can anybody say, what's the first instant at which he succeeds in passing the tortoise, because there isn't any such instant. There are always going to be an infinite number of instants between the instant you name and where he drew level. So that's a little bit counterintuitive, isn't it? So Achilles can draw a level. Well, again, Yusef, I mean, this is you're now sounding like Zeno because you're saying Achilles can draw a level but cannot overtake the tortoise. And indeed, we could have used this this argument just to, you know, to, to propose another Zeno's paradox, namely a variation of this one that that he can catch the tortoise, but he can't overtake him. It, it, of course, he can overtake him, but there is no first instant at which he does. If Achilles has a certain velocity right, which is, you know, distance per unit time, then we know that in a given measure of time, after they draw a level, at a given measure of time, however small you make it, then he will have gone past the tortoise, and he'll stay ahead for the rest of the race. That's certainly consistent with our common sense. When a smaller, a slower runner is overtaken, and the faster runner passes, the slower runner never catches up again, given that their speeds remain the same. Uh, the faster runner just keeps increasing the lead. We know that, and, and Zeno you know, would have to concede that. But what Zeno is really showing us is that we can never name the first instant at which he's ahead. We can only say that at any given interval of time, uh, definitely he'll be ahead. Given a certain time of intersection, any time after that, he'll be ahead of the tortoise. But there is no first time at which he'll be ahead of the tortoise. That's the point. Because if we count time in seconds, we can say one second after they draw a level, he'll be an infinite number of, of intervals ahead, an infinite number of points on the line ahead. Yeah. And the first the first half second, he'll be an infinite number of points ahead. And the first quarter of a second after they draw a level, Achilles will be an infinite number of points ahead. But there is no first point. There is no first point in that sequence. There's only a point at which they draw a level and after which, according to any arbitrary measure of time, then Achilles will remain ahead of the tortoise. But there is no first instant at which he is actually ahead, just as there is no last instant at which he fails to draw a level. And if you get both of those conditions and understand them, then you, you'll see that there's no paradox. There's just a very strange thing going on with respect to infinite numbers. Okay? And some of you who are probably um, concerned about math, well, we haven't really done any math. We, you know, there isn't going to be any math involved in this not anything seriously mathematical, it's just conceptual, just understanding the implications of what it means for a given line segment to contain an infinite number of points. And that's really mind-boggling in a certain way, uh, because infinity is not a number, right? That's a thing to bear in mind if you're encountering infinity for the first time. Well, infinity means uh, something that increases or decreases without bound. Yes, there's no end to infinity, just as there's no end to the number of points on a line. There is indeed Ramses, and I'm certainly not downplaying the understanding of math. Those of you who've done some mathematics or some geometry uh, or some algebra or indeed some calculus will definitely have 
potentially an easier time with Zeno's paradoxes. But, but remember, Zeno had at his disposal only Euclidean geometry, yes? So, uh, in, in principle, we don't really need any more than that. Okay, so now let me ask you whether you have any lingering questions about this problem or the previous one. Uh, we'll use the remaining time to try to clear up uh, any confusions that may have arisen. So please feel free to voice any questions uh, that, that you wish to raise. Uh, if you're missing something vital, I'll try to reiterate it. If, you, uh, if you're getting this, let me know. I, I need some feedback from you. Just tell me if, um, if this is interesting to you and if you, if you think you get it or if you want to think more about it. That's what we do in philosophy. We, we, we hear something for the first time and then we devote some thought to it. So uh, that's a good thing if you want to think about it. But I would, I would appreciate hearing uh, some feedback from you, either questions or comments. Uh, it's making sense. You need more time with it. Yes, Jesse, that would be the most uh, expected first reaction, is that, is that you really need to, to, as we say, wrap your mind around this. It's not trivial, right? These are easy things. These paradoxes are easy to state, but they're not necessarily trivial when we come to explaining you know, what the problem is and what we have to modify. So that's good. If it's beginning to make sense to you, and uh, if it is interesting, I'm also glad because this whole section is not all geometry. We're going to do some things that have all kinds of implications in sociology, economics, you name it. Some of the problems we're going to look at are, are, are very uh, far reaching and have a lot of traction in today's society. But we're starting with the ancient world and the kinds of things that preoccupied uh, philosophers then. Um, okay. Yes, uh, everything makes sense. Well, uh, if, if I'm making sense, then that's a good thing. Anytime a philosopher makes sense, that's a win. <laughs> we put that in the win column. We don't always make sense. <laughs> but if I'm making sense to you, that's a good thing. Um, but uh, uh, again, you want to, to think about it. Okay, the explanations are probably counterintuitive in some way or unusual in some way or new to you in some way. And that's why this is recorded, and you can look online. Believe me, there are some wonderful resolutions. Of, if you want to read all four paradoxes and really great resolutions to them, there's a philosopher of science, uh, or was, in Pittsburgh named Adolf Grunbaum. I'll put his name up. You know, if you want to write your third essay on this, um, uh, or, you know, any of the other problems that we, we tackle. Uh, Grunbaum did a really good little book on Zeno's paradoxes. You can also look at the usual resources like Stanford. They do a very good job with these, although somewhat technical at times. Uh, you know, the Zeno's paradoxes are famous, obviously. They've been around for a long time, and lots of people have devoted some, some effort to explaining them. So don't, don't rely on me. I have my own way of explaining things, and maybe somebody else will have an explanation that resonates better with you. That's entirely possible. Anything that becomes mathematical or logical uh, sometimes depends on the explanation, to be clear. And uh, often people who struggle with math, and I know this from experience because I tutored, um, I tutored students who had so-called math neurosis or math psychosis. You know, there are a lot of people out there who freak out when they encounter mathematics, but there's always a certain component that's necessary in higher education. And what I discovered through tutoring undergraduates who were freaking out, like nurses still have to do calculus, supposedly because they do these complicated calculations to set up traction machines, you know, I mean, for people who need their legs in traction, it's nonsense, you don't need calculus, but they're forced to study it. And my experience tutoring people who were basically having math neurosis problems usually boiled down to the fact that it wasn't explained to them in a clear way. And I think that there's nothing more frustrating than trying to get a handle on something that's not clearly explained. Because if the explanation makes the problem worse, not better, then you're going to struggle with it. Yeah? Um, some of you may have this experience in your own education. Yeah, Ramses. Okay, so you've encountered this. So it really a lot depends. I mean, mathematics, if it's properly explained, I think that many, many more people would not struggle with it. But the whole key is to get a clear explanation. And then it really is possible for us to absorb. So, okay, I'm seeing some agreement with that. And I'm not claiming to be an expert on explaining things, but I do have some experience doing it. And I think that uh, by and large, communication is really key, whether we're trying to explain it, you know, politics or mathematics. 
Uh, politics is more complicated. <laughs> that's, well, that's why Plato thought we needed to do 10 years of geometry before we tackled ethics and politics, because he thought those were much more, much more difficult subjects, more easy, easy for us to be led astray by faulty reasoning. But okay, uh, you have a lot of resources online if you want to delve more deeply into this problem or any of Zeno's problems, all right? Any other questions or comments? And I, you know, I'm glad that you're uh, making an effort and that you're making some headway. This is a bit of a new topic for some of you, but uh, it's, it's hopefully not unenjoyable. It's challenging, and it's somewhat fun if you're not freaking out with the geometry, <laughs> okay? Um, any other questions or comments? You're all, you're all lost in thought at this point. That, that's a good thing. Um, so we have just a few minutes left. You're welcome, Ashanti. So what I'm going to do now, uh, in the remaining time, I'm just going to tip my hand. I'll stop this share. Again, there are lots of diagrams online. and The definition of, par of this paradox, Arsh, you mean the, the, the Achilles paradox? Is that You're asking me to, to go over that again? Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the explanation that Zeno gives is that if the tortoise has a head start, then Achilles could never catch the tortoise because once the tortoise has a head start, then whenever Achilles catches up to where the tortoise was at that point of the head start, the tortoise will move further down the track, you know? And then when Achilles catches up to that point, again, it will take Achilles less time than the tortoise, but still the tortoise is going to have moved ahead again and by the time Achilles catches that place, then the tortoise will have moved slightly ahead. And so Achilles can never catch the tortoise because re regardless of where Achilles is, the tortoise is always a little bit further ahead. That's the, the, the general argument that Zeno gives. You know, I'm saying that wh what's wrong with it is that we all, we all know, given if we, you know, we know that Achilles will catch the tortoise, what Zeno is demonstrating is something much more complicated, actually, and much more interesting than he intended. What he's really demonstrating, and I'll repeat this again, is that there is no final instant at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. That is infinite. There are an infinite number of instants at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise. But just because there are an infinite number of instants at which Achilles fails to catch the tortoise does not by any means demonstrate that there is no first instant at which Achilles succeeds in catching the tortoise. And that, that is the, the explanation of the paradox. You may now want to hear that over and over and unpack it in your own minds. Okay? But, but those are two very different kinds of claims. Okay? And then I just wanted to throw you another complication and say by the same token, if you look on the other side of the point of intersection where Achilles does at some time catch the tortoise, at some place catches the tortoise, there's also no first instant at which he pulls ahead which is even more mind-boggling, because you know once Achilles pulls ahead, then Achilles stays ahead. But I'm saying for the same, by the same line of reasoning, there's no first instant at which he pulls ahead either. And that's because of the infinite divisibility of line segments. And they all contain an infinite number of points, no matter how small or large the segment is. Okay, and if you want to go, some of you who want to go into this infinity business, right, to get a handle on that, you would need to look at the work of Cantor, who did the breakthrough work. And some of you may have heard, if you're mathematics students, um, you will want to hear, uh, you'll want to look at the, at the, you'll want to look at Cantor's work on infinities, uh, because he was a, very, a Russian mathematician of the previous century. Uh, but he, he is the one who started looking into the sizes of infinities and found some infinities to be larger than others. That goes way beyond the scope of this course, but uh, it, will, it will also help explain, in some sense, how it's possible for different line segments to contain the same number of points. Cantor also Cantor demonstrated that. and He also demonstrated that, in fact, even um, a, a plane figure like a square or rectangle or contains the same number of points as a line. And even a volumetric figure like a cube contains the same number of points as a square or a line. Now, that's totally counterintuitive, right? But adding more dimensions to the figure doesn't actually increase the number of points. Now, that's totally mind-boggling. I mean, this beyond we're going way beyond Zeno. I'm just mentioning this, okay? So let me just give you uh, one more quick share before we wrap it up today. Uh, that's his last name. Um, his, his last name is Cantor. And if you Google infinity and Cantor, you'll very quickly pull up his first name, which, depending how you spell it, uh, is Gregor, I believe. Uh, he's a, he was a Russian. So I'm just doing this myself. 
uh, I don't speak Russian, but uh, it, go, Gorge, I mean, it's, it's, it's George, okay, in Russian, that's, that's the, the equivalent. So in Russian, they would say uh, the English transliteration would be this, George without an E, okay? That's how they'd spell his name in English. Uh, but he it made these incredible breakthroughs in theories of infinity, which were really mind-boggling and earth-shaking, much more than Zeno, okay? So last thing, and I'll leave you for today. Uh, on Thursday in my group, and I hope in your group also, you're going to tackle, uh, I think, a more yet a more interesting problem, and that's Zeno's arrow paradox. Let me quickly share the screen just to show you what it looks like. And again, my, my caution is don't try this at home, okay? <laughs> don't try this at home, uh, because Zeno's argument, and we'll look at this uh, in, in section M on Thursday, and I hope you will too in your breakout groups, Zeno argues that an arrow shot from a bow can't possibly fly through the air, okay? And he has another very plausible argument to make as to why this arrow can't really move anywhere. But again, common sense tells us you don't want to be standing in front of the bow when the archer lets fly the arrow, because we know perfectly well it does fly through the air. So again, the, the, the challenge will be to explain where is Zeno's reasoning going wrong when he, when he concludes that the arrow can't move if it's shot from a bow, and what do we have to modify about our understanding of the world in order to reconcile that with common sense, okay? Because something will change uh, when, we, when we take that paradox on the next day. All right, so thank you very much uh, for, for your feedback this morning. Yes, there's something very wrong, Jeremy. That's why I'm saying don't try this at home, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll look at that later, all right? But have a wonderful day, everybody, and uh, be well, be safe. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this. We'll have a lot more to come with puzzles and paradoxes. Uh, that's how we're going to end this have Okay? Uh, if anyone wants to stay for a minute, and no, I know one of you wants to talk to me, and that's fine. I'll be in the room momentarily. I'll be here for a minute, okay? So in the meantime, I'm ending the recording, and I'll look forward to seeing you all next time. Okay, be well, everybody, and you're more than welcome. Bye-bye for now.